May I speak in the name of our loving, liberating, and life-giving God. Amen. You may be seated. My first premarital counseling session with Sue and Lou began with the usual formalities, getting to know their history, observing the dynamic between them, reviewing the results of the lengthy questionnaire I'd had them complete weeks earlier. They both expressed frustration with how they moved through conflict and a desire to change their existing pattern. There had never been any physical violence between them, and neither was concerned for their safety, physical or emotional. Otherwise, we would have had very different conversations. They just felt, well, stuck, frustrated that they kept falling into the same unhelpful, often hurtful ways of relating. I invited them to describe what happened when they fought in as much detail as possible. There was always a precipitating event, they explained, usually something that seemed small, like a misunderstanding. They shared finances, a home, nights out, with ease. But that withering look he had, her tendency to roll his eyes when he felt most sensitive, the way Sue talked about his best friend, the way Lou forgot things at the grocery store, these could level them. A snippy back and forth ensued as each tried to understand what was going on and do their best to find their way back to something like center. Both saw their own communication strategies as essentially helpful. They were trying to reconcile, to resolve the issue, to repair the breach. But things would get more and more heated, and within a few minutes, neither of them was sure what they were even fighting about anymore. Emotions raw and red hot. While they didn't quite say this, I came to see that they had very different ways of trying to reconcile. As something like panic rose in Sue, she thought, this is not good, we have to get out of this, we better disengage before things get even more out of control. At the same time, Lou's mental alarm also ringing, he thought, this is not good, we have to get out of this, we better really dig in and talk this thing through until we get to the other side. Only at that very moment, Sue would stand from the table, begin collecting their plates, and say, this clearly isn't going anywhere, and start walking toward the kitchen. He'd be stunned, flooded by hurt and anger. Watching her move steadily away, his thoughts would spiral, and he'd start telling himself a story. She doesn't want to fix this. She doesn't care about us. She doesn't care about me. Still overwhelmed, he'd not quite yell, I can't believe you're just leaving. Placing the last plate in the sink, perhaps a little more aggressively than usual, she'd turn around, baffled, frustrated. Leaving? She'd gotten up to try to protect their relationship. This fight was going nowhere. Better to pause and pick it up another time, when they were both a little more grounded. Of course, she didn't actually say any of this because it clearly needed no explanation. And there Lou was, unwilling to let it go. Here they were, stuck in the same loop all over again. Now, some of you partnered adults might be sitting here thinking, it's weird that Claire seems to know so much about the argument we had last Tuesday. I kid. But the truth is, this dynamic is super common between two people sharing space and homes and life. We all know this couple. Many of us are probably in this relationship. Somehow, even when there is great love and respect and mutual admiration between people, humans have this incredible capacity for misunderstanding, for wounding. In close and intimate relationships, this is often a function of our early attachment experiences, how we interacted with our parents or caregivers, providing a map for our go-to strategies for securing safety and connection. 
we inevitably bring into our marriages, our homes, our friendships, I hate to see, say it, but even our jobs, pre-existing patterns, many of which actually work against us as adults. We're arguing with our wife and suddenly we're responding to them as if they were our mother. We're listening to our husband, but we hear the voice of our ex. We project onto a situation a whole host of meanings and anxieties that may not fit at all, except that some little thing, maybe of no consequence, was familiar, and bam, we are off to the races. Your partner stands to give herself some space and you feel abandoned. A harmless expression takes on enormous weight. Gestures become loaded. The trouble is, we think we're being clear. We think we're speaking the same language. But so often, we're not. In Ghana, where I studied abroad in college, I quickly learned that offering a friendly wave to a car as they made room for me to cross the streets was appreciated, as it is here. Unless I did so with my left hand, in which case it was the equivalent of flicking off the driver. I intended to say, thank you, based on my valid lived experience. But the driver read it as something else entirely, based on his also valid but different lived experience. Today's gospel is full of people from different places projecting their expectations onto one another, doing their best to read the signs of their life in light of their own lived experience, trying to understand and clearly, almost comically, falling short. Jesus, who is from Nazareth, decides to go to Galilee. There he meets Philip, who is from Bethsaida, which may or may not be near the northern shore. And Jesus says to him, follow me. Think about how many different meanings these words could have. Follow me so I can show you this interesting thing. Follow me so you don't get lost. Follow me along this narrow part of the trail so you don't fall. Walk with me, learn with me, come with me. We don't know precisely what Philip heard, only that he went to find Nathaniel, who is from beneath the fig tree, apparently, and said he had found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. Somehow, as a result of these two words, follow me, Philip decided that he knew who Jesus was. We could say he had sized him up, that he was projecting his own cultural and religious traditions onto him, reading him through the lens of the Torah. Or we could say that somehow, incredibly, Philip actually saw Jesus, that all it took for Jesus to cut through whatever else Philip might have projected onto him was two little words. Nathaniel, however, brought a totally different lens, a totally different set of biases to this moment. Can anything good come out of Nazareth, he asks. Sure, he has this Jesus character pegged. Nazareth was a backwater, home to country bumpkins or washed out hippies or white collar crooks or people too basic to bear, who knows. But Philip persists insists, and once Nathaniel actually meets Jesus, his eyes too are opened. They enjoy a rather odd exchange, and soon Nathaniel, like Philip, is calling Jesus by his true names, Rabbi, Son of God, King of Israel. So much of this encounter is confounding. Jesus himself doesn't seem to understand why Nathaniel sees him so clearly. Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree, he asks? It's weird. But grace is like that, surprising, inexplicable. It's weird. But there's something about Jesus that opens people to reality, fostering clarity and connection allowing them to see him and themselves 
and each other as they really are. The truth is, it is hard for us to see Jesus for who he really is. We bring to our encounters with him so much baggage. Is Jesus the sweet shepherd we've seen in so many stained glass windows, encircled in a warm golden glow, a child on his knee, a crook in his hand, skin white, beard brown? Is Jesus the judge, fundamentalists insist, await us at all our end, a harsh and cold and small-minded deity obsessed with rules and slavish obedience to them? Is Jesus anti-woman, anti-gay, anti-environment? Is Jesus a wisdom teacher whom some desperate and deluded souls decided to call God a few thousand years ago? Is Jesus a pawn of patriarchy, an emblem of imperialism? Does Jesus want us to be rich, happy, and powerful, or poor? Contemplatives or activists? Jesus could be almost anyone, depending on who you ask, depending upon what we project onto him. Which is why actually encountering Jesus for ourselves, whether in scripture, the wonder of the natural world, the words and warmth of other real human beings, the silence of our hearts, is so absolutely essential. Because what we believe about Jesus is what we believe about God. It is because God wants to be known, wants to be seen clearly, wants to be connected with us, that Jesus was born. Christians make a truly unique faith claim in our world that we are not called to come up with ideas about God, to spin our stories, to simply listen to what others say and then set all that in stone as if it was some shortcut to truth. Instead, we start with the actual life of Jesus, the actual person of Jesus, and insist in the words of theologian Ronald Rollheiser, this is how we come to know God and God's ways, through this complex, complicated, courageous, compassionate person, this person who walked with us and walks with us still, even when we are wrong, afraid, or uncertain. If we get Jesus wrong, we will, tragically, get God wrong, too. So how do we keep from getting Jesus wrong? Well, we can start by looking to the Gospels to set the record straight on this guy. And what we find there might really surprise and trouble us. Jesus, far from a cruel and petty judge, says to the accusers of a woman guilty of adultery, guilty, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Jesus, far from being obsessed with the uniquely Western idea of the nuclear family, tells a grieving son, let the dead bury their dead. Jesus, far from promising prosperity, invites people to leave their jobs in the middle of their shift, to ever so irresponsibly drop the ball, drop everything, actually, and follow him. Jesus, far from blessing the economy or the empire around him or our own, eats with enslaved people and befriends prostitutes and touches lepers, critiques exploitative taxes, tells parables about the rich who are indifferent to the suffering of their neighbors, spending eternity in hell. The very first word with which Jesus announces his earthly ministry, his mission, is repent, a word as misunderstood as he himself, a word which simply means change your mind, change your patterns, change your ways. Some of us are lucky enough to experience moments of clarity like Philip and Nathaniel, when the scales simply fall from our eyes, when we are freed from our habits our selfishness and greed and sense of superiority or inferiority lifted, never to ensnare us again. 
Sometimes change is easy, but much of the time, we are not so lucky. I was recently listening to a podcast with New York Times bestselling author Gretchen Rubin. Based solely on the title of her first and wildly popular book, The Happiness Project, I admit that I expected to dislike her quite a lot, <laughs> but was thankfully not so deterred that I didn't take it out from the library a few years ago and let myself be surprised. I really enjoyed the book, full of engaging stories, surprising research, practical tips, and helpful resources. In the interview, she and the host were talking about how it is that we change, even slowly. And she said, it's helpful to remember that it's a lot easier to change our surroundings and our schedules than it is to change ourselves. I heard this and felt within me a deep yes. If we want to be more peaceful, we're probably going to have less luck simply willing ourselves to feel calmer and more present than we will sitting down, making a list of activities and people and places that make us feel peace, and then doing the thing or visiting the person or taking ourselves to the place. I'm not saying that there's no place for working directly with our thoughts and feelings, trying to shift our assumptions and beliefs and biases. There is. But never once in all the Gospels does Jesus call someone he has just met to be his disciples with the words, believe in me, worship me, think about me a lot, pray to me. Every single time he says the same thing, follow me, move with me, walk in my ways, follow me. Change not how you're thinking, but how you're spending your days, your money, your life, so that it more closely resembles my own. Change your surroundings, your habits, who you're spending time with, what you're spending energy on. Follow me. Do as I do. Care for the marginalized and the sick. Open your heart to the pain and grief of others. Take risks, even costly ones, in the interest of justice. Eat well, rest well, cultivate deep and nourishing friendships, apologize, share, heal, and help, and get away every now and then to be alone with God. There is a place for thinking our way into right action, but Jesus himself seems pretty biased toward action first. Want to draw closer to God? Want to feel more presence and peace and hope and joy? Want to be free from your less helpful patterns, your projections, to see yourself, the world, even God anew? Maybe we can start by holding up our schedules and our surroundings to the example of Jesus to our experience of Jesus, letting go of our pre-existing ideas and assumptions and opening our hearts and our eyes to his way. Maybe try doing what he did, spending time with the kind of people he spent time with, walking where he walked. Maybe walking in his ways, we'll find ourselves walking beyond our assumptions our limited biases, our fears. Maybe when changing our schedule, surroundings, and spending habits, our stories, and even ourselves, will follow. What if, when Jesus said, follow me, he meant just that? What if? What then? Amen.